Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we venture to a beautifully situated medieval abbey overlooking the River Tees, just south east of Barnard Castle. It was established around 1195 by a group of Premonch detention canons. The monks, who were all ordained priests, were known as the White Canons because of their distinctive white attire. Throughout its history the abbey suffered from ongoing poverty, the haunting of the mad monk, and not to mention raids from the Scots. So join us as we explore the peaceful site of Eggleston Abbey. The abbey was founded in 1196, and as with many other Premont Retention houses, the abbey was built in a remote location, away from the existing settlements, but close enough to running water of the River Tees. Then in the 12th century, towards the early 13th, a church was enlarged in a rebuilding program that began at the east end and worked westwards. Elements of the old church were incorporated into the new building, especially to the north where it adjoined the cloister and at the west end. This enlarged church that we walk around compromised a four bay nave with a crossing, north and south transepts with eastern aisles. Around this time too, a new range was added to the west side of the cloister, which was the abbot's lodgings. The main surviving elements of the abbey are the nave and the chancel of the church, and the east end range of the cloister. Although the ruins of the abbey indicate that it was a magnificent building, it was always in a state of poverty. To retain its abbey status, they always needed 12 canons, and at times even struggled to achieve this. Failing to do so would have resulted in the abbey being downgraded to a priory status. When the bishops visited, they often reported that the monks were not sticking to the rules, particularly the ones concerning periods of silence and wearing the appropriate garb. Controversy had also hit the abbey when one of the canons was killed in an accident caused by another with whom he had argued. In another strange incident, the canons were banned from carrying long knives in the nearby town of Barnard Castle. The abbey had also had problems raising enough money to pay the required taxes to the crown. To make matters worse, it was damaged by both the invading Scottish army in 1315 and later the English army when it was stationed there on its way to fight the Scots at the 1346 Battle of Neville's Cross. It's said that the English soldiers did so much damage that the abbot claimed compensation from the commanding general. The canons were ordained priests who lived an austere, frugal existence, most of the time in silence. They were strict vegetarians and largely self-sufficient. In 1540, the abbey was dissolved during the suppression of the monasteries, and in 1548, Eggleston was acquired by Robert Strelly and his wife, who converted the buildings later into a mansion. Right at the south end of the East Range, adjoined by a north transept, was the chapter house, the meeting room for the canons to discuss their business, and a place where discipline was dispensed. It's now reduced to ruins and its foundations. Interestingly, there is a grave slab in the southeast corner that may have belonged to one of the abbots, and normally the chapter house would have also been a favoured final resting place for the heads of the abbey. As I mentioned earlier, the East Range was substantially altered in the 16th century, when it was converted into a mansion. The mansion was originally two storeys high, but during its later conversion a third floor was added, and there was a widespread adding of fireplaces, windows and doors, which we can still see today. During the active part of the abbey life, the first floor would have been taken up by the canon's dormitory, from which there was an access past the chapter house and down into the north transept, via a staircase, which was also known as the night stair. The north wall of the main space was brought forward in the 16th century, when fireplaces were built in front of it. At ground floor level though, a beautiful arch built in the 13th century gives you access to both the staircase that takes you to the first floor. The other doorway leads into a ground room floor with a beautiful ribbed vaulting and an impressively sized fireplace as well, as leading into further two doors, one in the north and one in the west wall, 
both of which were latrines. The fireplace inside the ground floor and the latrines suggests that it was once the infirmary of the abbey, where the sick were cared for and the monks periodically bled. Moving on into the North Range and the refectory of the Abbey, it was the place where the canons took their meals. Almost entirely from the 12th and the early 13th century, and during the monastic period, the upper storey was the refectory. The ground floor beneath was vaulted and divided into three chambers, of which the easternmost containing an original fireplace was actually the warming house. Where the North Range met the East Range, a passage led from the cloister to the room below, the Riva Daughter. The West Cloister Range was built into two phases. The earlier phase can be seen in the inner wall which overlooks the cloister. The remains of this earlier range will survive beneath the cloister, and the ground floor of the later range would have also been an undercroft, used for storage. From the lack of vaults, it is actually assumed that the upper storey was of timber, but its function was uncertain. Doors leading through to the late 13th century wall open onto a complex of earthworks which lie to the west of the standing remains of the abbey. These include a pathway and platforms that represent the sites of the additional buildings, which would have included kitchens, a brew house and a bakehouse. Additional features to the south of the standing remains include three banked enclosures that contain the earthwork remains of the other buildings, like the barns or granaries. As with many castles, abbeys and priories, we love to explore the folklore tales that might exist, which leads me to a story of the abbey being haunted, following through this tale of the mad monk. In the 1300s, an apprentice monk named Brother Martin lived at the abbey. The monks were allowed to leave the abbey occasionally, to go fishing or for nearby walks. But one moonlit evening, Martin went for a walk alongside the river and met a young lady who tried to speak with Martin. But because he did not want to break his vows, he turned and fled from the lady. The next few weeks passed and Martin simply could not forget this lady's face and her voice. So again he retraced his steps in the hope to meet her. Sure enough, he met with the lady again, and this time they spoke. He apologised for fleeing before spending the evening talking and laughing for hours, and promising to meet her again the next evening. They met every night in their secret place, where they eventually became lovers. Although in the back of Martin's mind he had the feeling of guilt whenever he wasn't with her. He eventually confided in another monk who was worried about Martin's unusual behaviour, and his pale complexion, and found Martin weeping in his bed one night. The other monk advised that he shouldn't leave the abbey grounds anymore, and he should tell his wrongdoings to the father superior. The next few weeks passed and Martin remained in his room, praying and sobbing for forgiveness for all of his sins, but one evening it all became too much for him. He ran from his cell in the dead of the night, in the hope to meet the lady who he adored. She was waiting for him, as she had done every night since their last meeting. She was excited to see him, but Martin was overcome with rage. He was sweating and he was breathless. She asked him if he was okay, or if he was ill, but Martin lost control of his temper, grabbed her, and shouted, accusing the lady of being evil and being sent from the devil to tempt him. He lashed out, screaming in rage, and wrestled her to the ground, while she was screaming for help but with no one around, her screams just faded into the cold night. He had told her to be quiet, but her screams continued, so he put his hands around her throat, and soon enough she fell silent. He had killed her. Now this may just seem like a story that was passed down generation to generation of locals in the area, but actually some paranormal investigators have seen a monk and a lady around the abbey ruins and have also heard faint screams coming from the banks of the Tees. I find visiting obscure ruins as rewarding as visiting the potentially overhyped, infinitely more crowded, better known larger castles and ruins. And Eggleston has a beautiful vibe, and the sounds of the sheep grazing in the fields next to it is usually all you can hear. 
If not for the history, a visit here is definitely worth it for the wonder. So we hope you've enjoyed a visit with us today and you feel encouraged to want to take a visit here. If you did, please hit that like button and consider us on our Patreon or by joining our channel memberships. We want to say a big thank you for all of the support from our channel members and our Patreons. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.